So good morning, everyone. We'll we'll try to get started. We're we're two minutes earlier than our late start time. So uh, I apologize. I gave you an extra three than I planned to do today. Um, for our uh, illustrious Zoom crowd, I'll just remind you. The camera's here, but I can see you up there. So sometimes if I'm talking to you and looking that direction, it's, I'm not really trying to ignore you. Uh, the other thing, just for you to note, uh, because you're up there instead of other places, I may not see you waving at me, but the volume is left turned up here in the auditorium. So if you unmute and speak, we should be able to hear it. So if you feel the need to or desire to interject, please do so, uh, especially if I haven't caught any of your visual cues. Uh, so I'll just offer that up to you. Okay, so welcome back. For those of you that were here last week, especially welcome back. That means it didn't run you off. Uh, so that's good. Uh, we are lightly attended today. That's a little bit, uh, it was known, so uh, I'm not offended. I hope none of you are as well. So I just really wanted to dive straight in because, as I mentioned last week, we're a little bit behind where I wanted to be, so we have a little catching up to do. I think we'll be able to do some of that today, uh, and we'll just work on it together and, and see what we can come up with. Again, there'll be, as I mentioned last week, there's there was something that was kind of conflicting in my mind about what I was reading in different places in the Old Testament. Uh, so I had a few conversations, a little more study about that. I think we've got a, a reasonable solution to it so that we're not going to come out of here very concerned that we found some flaw, which obviously we know there isn't one. Uh, it's, it's all in our interpretation of those things. So I will also remind you again, as we talked about last week, remember that this book, as Many of them are uh, in the Old Testament, but especially in Deuteronomy. It, this is mostly historical reciting of what's happened. And as I mentioned last week, there's a, there's a little bit of, I don't want to say conflict, that's the wrong word, but there's a little bit of back and forth in the timeline. So we may be talking about something that's current at the moment, but then the next verse may jump us back 100 years. So there's a lot of back and forth, and it's, it's very difficult to follow. So there may be even times where I may say something that may not be quite on target because it's either current or it's past and I may not have caught that uh, in my notes. So if I make those mistakes, please pardon me. Uh, that's again why I do kind of encourage you to follow along a bit with us just as we're reading through. And that way we all help learn at the same time. It's, that's my goal out of all this. So we've covered that one. Dave, I'm using my checklist to do. That's, that's very good. All right, so we talked about the timeline confusion. Not confusion, but all right. So I think that means we're ready to start. So we are now in Deuteronomy chapter three. We covered one and two last week, plus an intro. So a little bit of tiny bit review. Uh, we were talking about the kings uh, that the Israelite nation had come across or were coming to uh, and the things that had occurred. So in, in chapter two, there was discussion about Sihon. So now in chapter three, we're opening up with King Og, O-G, who is the king of Bashan. And I may be saying that wrong as well. Uh, but the scripture is telling us that King Og of Bashan is going to be the next area that the Israelite nation is to conquer. They are to take over. So you can remember there were ones that they had some type of treaty and a agreement to pass through, but they paid their way, paid for food and drink that they consumed in those other lands. They were not to mess with those lands. Came to Sihon, now they're coming to Og. Those are ones God has said, you will go and conquer this area. This one is given to you. So that's where we pick up now. So if you're following along, chapter three, we get into verse three, where again, he's being, he's telling them, leave no survivors. That's, Everybody is gone, wiped out, which is a, a very scary prospect for us living in today's world to think that there's an entire area, maybe even considered a nation, totally wiped off the planet. They are to be completely removed. Men, women, children, all gone. That That's hard for us to comprehend because it's just so foreign from what we believe is maybe good and right. But certainly if God's giving you those commands, and if you're finally to a point now that you're trusting him and following those commands, 
that's what they were appointed to do. And, and so they went and did. As with previously, they were allowed to keep cattle, livestock, plunder. Uh, so not everything was slaughtered, only the humans. Right? The other things that became valuable, they were allowed to keep. Uh, and then it's notable here that uh, in this particular area, it included 60 cities. Uh, so I don't know how large the land area was, but it was large enough to have 60 cities in it. And I would imagine it's much like we're probably even better than our today's mind. We think of the city of Austin, but there's a bunch of little cities around it. Houston, Dallas, those are all very similar. I kind of don't think that's probably how this worked. If you had a city right next to a city, you were probably just one big city. So my guess is those 60 cities were spread out over a pretty good distance. That's just my interpretation of it. I, I have nothing to back that up on other than logically it wouldn't seem to me there would be cities bordering right next to each other so much uh, that you could cram 60 in a small area. I think the idea here is it's a pretty wide, large area. Some of these cities of those 60s, of those 60, uh, were noted specifically that they were secured with high walls, gates, and bars. So some of these cities, not again, just not an encampment somewhere. He's presenting and giving us extra information here that tells us they were highly secured. So there's also means there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of development. They got those walls in place, the gates built and bars installed, all of those kinds of things. My thought about that specifically is think again of the people in that time where they've been worried about approaching people that are considered giants, much larger than them, yet they were to go and overtake. Now they're coming to these cities that are well fortified, as it sounds. And I think maybe that's another piece of information for the Israelite nation to listen and think about is you, you're not just going and knocking over a tent. You're going to a well fortified city, but God is with you. Therefore, those things don't hold power over him. They may be meant to keep people out, provide them protection, but it will fail against God's power. And God's plan. So I, I offer that up that a, a man made defense he's demonstrating to them right now is really immaterial in his plan. He has the power to overcome those. Now, and there's a notable thing happening in verse 11 uh, that I want to draw your attention to. It specifically talks about Og's bed. Again, one of those, scratch your head a little bit. Why is this in there? What, what, he had a really big bed. Okay. So verse 11, uh, it gives us the dimensions, nine cubits long by four cubits wide. Uh, we're told that that should be approximately 14 by six feet. Okay, so a six foot wide, but 14 feet long. You can put two people head to toe lengthwise in it. Why would you need a bed that large? I don't know. Maybe Og was large. We don't get that piece of information. So maybe the size isn't so much of the biggest concern. What also gets called out is that it was decorated with iron. Now, we may not think much about that today because you may have a iron headboard or other certain things that may be on your own beds or beds you've certainly seen in a store or, or now you've seen online. Um, so again, scratch your head. Why, why is this piece and level of detail here? What, what does that bring? What does that add? What is it that we're missing by just kind of reading through and saying, oh, he had a big bed. Maybe it was a little bit fancy. Well, as we know, if God puts the words in, there's something there. He's, he's probably not adding a lot of filler just to help it make the right page break for the next page. Um, so that means we do a little more research. So iron, back in the day, as we might say, uh, was an, considered an economic asset. Am I still on? Okay. Adjusting the sound just a little bit. So it was an economic asset uh, that gained a ruler, as he was, some enhanced political power. And it was also a degree of social standing. So someone that had iron, that was, that was a very desired material. It was indicative of someone with power, political power, economic power, 
and again, a social standing. I'm, I'm that powerful. I'm that important. I have iron. And in this case, not just having iron, but iron to spare, to decorate your bed with. So I'm figuring, how do I put this in today terms? And it seems to me maybe our comparison today would be someone fabricates their bed out of solid, pure gold. Because maybe iron doesn't have quite the same connotation to us as maybe gold does for us today. So if you have so much that you can take a precious metal that's worth so much and has so much standing and so much clout about it, you have so much of this, you can even make your bed out of it. To me, that seems to be somewhat of the message here. That Og, the king, is so great and has so much power and has so much at his disposal. He even had his bed made out of iron, which was very important to them at the time. He didn't even need it to make more weapons. He got enough of those because he's got so much. He's decorating his bed. He's got so much. That's kind of how I was seeing it. Um, there's a couple of articles out there that I read across. Um, I found it very interesting. It, it seems to kind of follow just a bit. So consider again back in the idea that God's telling us something through that part of the story. He's telling us about the character of Og or of a king in that time and that the Israel nation should know God's power is more than that. So not just he's a king, but I'm going to tell you go overtake it and that this city is maybe has high walls and you're going to knock those down too. The king has so much power and so much ah, about him. We don't even care that he's got a bed made out of iron. You are more powerful than that. He seems to be reiterating this over and over. I kind of think like last week, this may be a, another connection to say, I'm God, you need to trust me. I will show you all of the vastness and all of the riches that should be against you. Yet you operating under my plan, you will overcome it. That That's where I go with that one. Uh, I certainly welcome your own thoughts at if you have any extras on that, uh, but if not, I don't see any waving and jumping up and down yet. So we'll keep pushing. So next we get to hear them talk about the areas that will be divided among the tribes. And at this point, they still haven't crossed the Jordan. So they're just, they're just entering these areas where he has said, you will conquer, you will overtake them. So Sihon and Og, the two kings, are now generally, they've been overthrown the giant people, the big cities, all of these things. So now he tells us, we're going to take some of this area and we're going to divide it up. And that's between the Reubenites and the Gadites and half of the tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, Manasseh. Yes, uh, you know, however we pronounce that, we know it's two and a half tribes worth of people will assume that land and settle there. It will become theirs. It's given. So keep that in mind, that's starting to set up just a little bit of the conflict that I think we get to work through here in just a moment. So there are lands now have been assigned to these two and a half tribes on this side of the Jordan. So they're there, they've conquered it. They're being told, these will be your areas. Then comes verse 18. And in verse 18, this is again something we, we're going to talk through a little bit. They are told that all able-bodied men armed for battle must continue on. They will not stay there. They will continue on across the Jordan to help the rest of the Israelite nation take the rest of the lands that God has promised them. So again, a little head scratching. The women, the children, the livestock may stay there, though. So they didn't conquer it and just keep moving. He's saying, you're going to leave behind the women, children, and livestock. Because he even in indicates, I know you have a lot of livestock. So they've been pretty, uh, pretty fortunate with what they've conquered and taken. They've got so much livestock that God even recognizes. I'm not telling you to move all of that either. All that's going to kind of stay behind. But the men that can fight need to go. They don't get to stay here yet. They'll come back when all the rest of the fighting is done. 
So we need them. So my first pass at that was, okay, so those two and a half tribes worth of women and children and livestock stay here, but the men have to keep going. And they go before the nation, right? before the Israelite nation. And so my initial thought was, well, maybe these were the best fighters. They happen to be from those tribes. And so maybe they were kind of the advanced team. But as I read more and tried to study more, research more, I, I think I realized I was mistaken about that. I believe what it was saying was maybe all of the women and children and livestock stay, not just from the two and a half tribes, but probably from the entire nation. And only the fighting men cross the Jordan to go conquer so that they're not bringing women, children, and livestock with them. They're kind of hanging back in the area that's already been conquered. I think that's probably how it went, um, which adds another piece of interest to me of, okay, he's telling us some very specific things. But my mind, I'm thinking you've just passed through a couple of areas of land where you've had a treaty that lets you pass through safely. But you need to treat them fairly. And they're going to revere you as wise and understanding. And now, theoretically, your vulnerable population, your women, children, livestock, are going to stay there. And all of the fighting men and armor goes away to go conquer other lands across the Jordan. Which to me means the ones remaining behind don't have much protection. And they're right next to other lands that they just passed through who could possibly easily look at that area and say, well, all the fighting men are gone. We could just go conquer them like they did to our former neighbors and look at all the cattle and livestock and iron beds and such that we might get our hands on. But for some reason, that prospect doesn't ever seem to arise in the, in the scripture. We don't hear that that's a concern. Strong women is the comment. I've, Probably so. I mean, they've been in a desert for how many years? I mean, yes. Uh, no doubt they can they can probably handle their own just a bit. So what I'm thinking again is this is part of the reason I think that they came through peacefully through those other areas under treaty to say, we're gonna we're gonna handle you fairly. We're gonna respect your areas and not take from you, even though we might be able to. We will not fight you for these things. Because God tells us this. And if those lands and those people have now understood them as wise and understanding, they may be thinking two or three times before they even get a hint of an idea that maybe we can go take those lands for ourselves. Because they've just seen what's happened. The 60 cities, well fortified, the giant people. But God prevailed. So... I think these pieces of the story are starting really to plug in together that even the lands around them start to understand you don't mess with the Israelite nation's God. Look what he's provided and given for them. Which is kind of neat because it seems to be focused on convincing the Israelite nation about the power of God. Yet we see maybe there's a little bit of bleed over into the surrounding nations as well that they can start to understand you were spared Thanks for signing the treaty. And I think that has them thinking more than twice about maybe we could go and take over because they know they'll be fighting against God. I, I think there's something. There. Anyway, just a, just a little, little something extra that jumped in my mind about, isn't that interesting they could leave behind a group that might be considered unprotected? Uh, yet there doesn't seem to be any presentation that there was concern about doing that. I think previously in the story, it would have told us, and the Israelite nation didn't trust that God would protect them, and they said, no, we'll wait, or no, we'll have these folks stay by and stand guard against attack from neighboring communities because our women, children, and livestock are all here. And they're in bed, don't forget that one. But he doesn't say that. So I, find, I found that very interesting. I, I hope it has raised a little curiosity in your mind, too, about really what what is the message happening here? What is he telling Israelites and the surrounding nations. That seems pretty interesting to me. Okay, so we jump to verse 21 next again, if you're following along. So now Moses is starting to explain a little deeper here. And at this point, it seems to be a little more one-on-one -on -one conversation. That's not necessarily addressing the entire nation. So Moses tells Joshua that the Lord's going to fight for them. 
Now, certainly this is something they've been hearing as a whole nation. Certainly Joshua would have understood that, just as Moses has. But he's very specific in saying, Moses tells Joshua, the Lord will fight for you. And by the time verse 25 rolls around, now we start to hear Moses starting to talk about his conversation with God again. And Moses says, I, I really want to see the land. Right? I've been through all of this. I've, I have helped lead these people through you, God. I mean, I'm certain he was quite understanding that Moses wasn't the one with the power doing these things. I think he understood clearly that God was behind all of it. So Moses said, I, I really want to see the land. But God says, no. He makes an answer. The answer is no. But in verse 27, he says, all right, look, you've, you've done some great things. Thanks for doing what I've told you. So I want you to go up to Mount Pisgah or Nebo, depending on where you're reading and what you're reading and how it was translated. Those appear to be the same mountain. So God tells Moses, you can go up there and you can look from there, but you will not cross the Jordan. So this is where my potential conflict came because back in Numbers 20, God told Moses, because you didn't trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. That seems pretty clear. You will not bring them into the land I'm giving them. But here we are in Deuteronomy. He's not bringing them into the land. He has brought them into the land. They're in an area where two and a half tribes have been given the promised land. So we, we have to stop and think for a second. They were told promised land. And we have to understand that existed on both sides of the Jordan. On the east side, where they are currently, two and a half tribes worth of land was promised and given. They haven't crossed the Jordan yet. That's the rest of it. So I'm really struggling with that one. He said, you're not going to go in the promised land, yet they're physically standing it. So he tells Moses, you can go up on this mountaintop and you can look. And he's specific to say, you can look north, south, east, and west. I'm not super big into geography, but I know that if I stand at a point and I look in all four directions around me, that must mean I'm inside of the area I'm supposed to look at. So I'm, again, I'm trying to figure this out. How is he not in the promised land already? Um, so I best I can gather that we would say he is physically in the physical land, the soil where they will be, but it has not yet been established as the Israelite nation's promised land. And this is something I talked to Danny about last week as well. The Jewish concept of something being the promised land or being in existence required their action to make it so. So merely walking into the area, standing on the actual soil, doesn't make it the promised land. The promised land occurs when the Israelite nation does what they're supposed to do in the promised land. So maybe that's a, a ticky-tack terminology catch. I, I don't know. Um, but it seems to be the only rational conclusion to draw if they're physically standing in an area that has been given as promised land, and it's already been told this is yours, and you're in it and you look, 360 degrees around and that's you're seeing all of it so it must stand to follow the, the things that maybe we don't understand clearly because history doesn't doesn't translate and document well from that long ago sometimes uh, that the people were physically on the soil that was promised to them but it had not yet been declared the promised land because they had merely just arrived at it and they had not begun to flourish and it hadn't reached its conclusion of becoming the promised land yet. That probably deserves a couple of months every day long study to try to really arrive at that. Uh, but it, again, at this point, it seems to be the most logical, reasonable conclusion. That's certainly better than any human trying to say that God made a mistake. 
which obviously uh, our group of folks here for sure would, would not uh, would not think would be a wise choice. So again, make make sure that that's to you. You're you're hearing it. There needed to be action involved to create this as the promised land instead of the soil that would become it, even though they were standing in it and had theoretically, quote, conquered it at this point. And then toward the very end there at chapter 3, verse 28, God indicated, Moses, you're not going to go. I've already told you that. I'm telling you again, you're not going. You're not going to cross the Jordan. And again, remember, that's a difference in this book versus Numbers. Numbers was, you won't go in the promised land. You will not lead them there. In Deuteronomy, it shifts slightly and says, you will not cross the Jordan. So again, not necessarily a disconnect in the story, but maybe a clarification. You're not going to cross the Jordan, but Joshua will go. He will now be the one leading them across the Jordan. And he gives Moses a, a pretty simple yet clear and direct. You will strengthen and encourage him. Right? You've led all of the people through all of these coming out of Egypt and all the plagues in the desert and, and the Red Sea. And you've done all these things. Now, he has been through some of those things. You need to strengthen and encourage him because now he needs to be able to do those same things based on the trust he will have in God. And that ends chapter three. Action packed. Okay, so we're going to jump into four because my time is just tipping away at me very quickly. All right, so chapter four now, we pick up again where the Israelite nation is hearing the laws and decrees again. As I mentioned before, this is very much part of the treaty process that the people of that time would have been exposed to and, and really understanding. You hear laws and decrees and you hear them again and you hear them again and you hear them again. It's repetition. Um, which again becomes remarkable in that time. Nothing's really written down. It's, we don't post it on the internet and everybody gets to read it. We don't file share it and text a message to our friend. And did you hear them say that? This, this is done through speech where they're hearing it over and over. We have the advantage of seeing it documented later. Um, but the fact that all of that's happening and there's still not a, not a conflict a deep conflict in any of the, the stories we're hearing or the laws and, and rules we're hearing is pretty interesting. So he tells, he tells the people, God says, you will follow the laws and decrees to live and to take possession of the land. So he's kind of putting a bit of a condition on it. Here's the laws and decrees and you will do this because it allows you to live and allows you to take possession of the land, which I believe we should be thinking it allows his plan to be followed. It allows them to conquer the lands. So if they're not going to follow laws and decrees, things are not going to go so well for them. They will start to fail. So then they begin talking about being prepared to take the land. So again, remember, they are already got the stuff on the east side of the Jordan. So they're really talking about we're going to cross the Jordan and go and do these things, which means preparing to take the land. He specifically reminds them and tells them again, you do not add to the commands. You do not subtract from the commands. My laws, my decrees, you don't add to them, you don't take away from them. I'm telling you what you need to know. This is it. Don't believe you're on God's level to start rationalizing what's important, what's not, or what might be nice to do instead. He's already telling them right now, that's not how the plan works. The plan's made. I'm giving it to you. Go do. So in verse 3, he reminds them that other Israelites, so again, a little bit of a historical throwback, other Israelites were destroyed for following Baal. So he's reminding them again, I'm God. My plan, you follow. You do. And when you don't, you see don't think you've attained some degree of status that now you won't ever be harmed, even if you do wrong, because you'll see from history when people of your own Israelite nation have not followed the laws and decrees, they have suffered. They have not survived that. So you've been taught. I'm telling you again. I'm teaching you again. Repetition. 
verse 6 reminds them again, you will be known as wise and understanding to the other nations. We've already seen that proven in lands that they passed through peacefully. They were revered as wise and understanding. Now maybe that's what's causing that area to remain protected as the fighting men are preparing to move on. And then in verse 9, he reminds them that they are to teach these ways to their children and their children to teach it to their children. So he's, he's definitely creating and painting the picture here. This is the law and it lasts. This is not a one-time thing just until you get the land and then you're free from it. This is a continual thing. The law is and the law remains. That's, that's going to become very important. This, this was not just follow the law and then you can do what you like after that once the conquering is over. He's, he's already set that up. That's not how it's going to work. Verse 12, he reminds them that God was present as fire when he spoke to them previously. But they never saw anything of any form. Right? So he specifically used the word form. So God has spoken to them and they have theoretically seen him represented by fire at night, cloud by day. And the only thing that they've ever seen or heard has been sound. It's only a voice. They have heard God's voice speak. But they've never seen anything of any form. And that becomes very interesting to them. It's just a voice. You've seen fire, you've seen cloud, but there's nothing of form. And he brings that in then very clearly in verse 15, where he says, you will not have any idols. You will not create idols. Okay. Zoomers, is the mic clicking and clacking for you, or is that just here? It's fine? Okay. Well, I don't know what we're doing over here, but we'll keep going on this just a little bit because I don't have much more time. Uh, if it gets really bad, we may switch out microphones, but we'll try not to do that. So verse 15, he says, don't have any idols. And it's kind of interesting then to think about that in terms of not having seen God in any form and only having heard him. How would you make an idol out of something to reflect something that had no form to you? It's it, like it's impossible to make an idol, I guess, unless you're making a flame or a cloud. Uh, which probably wasn't terribly easy then. So he's reminding them, you've seen these other nations and these other peoples worship idols and create these things that are to represent some being that they thought needed worshiping. And God's telling them, I've never even shown you what I might look like for you to make an idol out. Therefore, there's more reinforcement. Idols are not necessary. You make an idol... You're basing it on some concept you've dreamed up on your own because I haven't given you anything to base it on. So if the people stop and think just a moment, we can make calves and beds of iron or whatever it may be. And God's saying, well, I, haven't, I haven't given you any indication that that's what you should think of when you think of me. Rather, when you think of me, you should be thinking of what I've done for you and what I've given you. So... Reminds them, stay away from the idols. Um, they, they've got nothing to base creating an idol on. He's given them no form to base it on. I find that very interesting. He also reminds them, don't bow down to the sun, the moon, or the stars. And he qualifies that a little bit further, and he says, because those have been apportioned to all of the nations. Which should be telling the Israelite nation the sun and the moon and the stars are not just ours. We're not the only ones that see them or that survive by the heat or the coolness or whatever comes from those. Those are available for everyone. Which also means they're not appropriate for the Israelite nation to be somehow idolizing or worshiping because they are not the things that gave them conquering ability over these other things. So if the sun and the moon and the stars are for everyone, then they're also for the Egyptians that they overpowered. They're also for all of the plagues and all of the things that occurred in the desert and passing through the sea, and all these other nations that they've either passed peacefully or conquered. Those folks had same access to the sun, moon, and stars. So therefore, it seems, the sun and the moon and the stars are not what allowed them to overthrow those areas because they were available to them as well. 
it was God and God alone. And he tells them then, closing out this piece in verse 20, you, the Israelites, are God's inheritance. He has set up that you are his people. You receive the promises he's given. This seems to be a bit remarkable again. He's reminding them, I've done these things for you. This is important. Okay, so we jump into verse 25. It's a little uncomfortable because he, now he's going to explain to them, here's all the good things I've done. Here's the things I expect of you. Next part of the treaty talk, here's what's going to happen if you don't. The threat, as we might consider it. I'm, I'm threatening you if you don't do what I've just said. Here's what's going to happen. Do it or else. This is the or else portion. A violation of the law after you've been here a long time in the promised land. Once you're there, once it's established, you've been here a while. You've had children and you've had grandchildren. If you violate the law, it will mean death and destruction, and it'll come quickly. So there's there's a bit of there's a bit of directness here that that is interesting to us. Should be, okay. I'm telling you things are good and great, and here's what you need to do. But if you don't follow it, even after you've been here for a while, again, remember this is stretching into the treaty doesn't just last until you conquer the land and then you're free to go wild and do what you'd like. The law remains. And now you have been here long enough to have children and grandchildren. That's still not long enough to think that my treaty with you is complete. You are still bound by the laws because if you don't follow them, Death and destruction will follow, and it's coming fast. It's it's not going to be multiple generations past you that somebody will pay for the things you're doing now. You're on notice. I'm watching. It's not going to be good. And he says, if that happens, only a few will survive. So at least we're hearing the Israelite nation isn't under threat of being completely wiped off, as we've seen him do in other areas. He says, well, there may be a few of you that survive, but you're going to get chased out of the promised land area. You're going to lose the area I've given you, that I promised to you. Uh, and only a few of you will survive, but you're going to be in other areas. And you're going to be serving those people, and your life will be miserable again, just like it was under the Egyptians. So, again, there's a bit of weight going behind this to say, okay, I may not wipe you all the way out, but you're not going to love life. You're going to lose all of the good things that I've just got done explaining to you over and over about all the great things you're going to have and how great it will be. You will have none of that. You will suffer. And these people, surely from the stories of their ancestors, know what suffering sounds like and what it looks like. Obviously not something they want to repeat. Verse 28, he tells them, you'll be going to places where they worship man-made gods of wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or eat or smell. Again, me, head scratchy time. The, there's a level of detail here that is interesting. He just got done talking to them about, I'm God and I've given you no representation of my form. I'm a fire, I'm a cloud, I'm a voice. Yet he's making a comparison here about seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling. Very human senses. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm puzzled. What, what does this mean? What could it mean? Um, to me, it seems like he's showing a bit of his quote form by linking it to a sense, sensory perceptions that the Israelites can relate to. They may be having trouble relating to speaking from a fire or speaking from a cloud and leading them in that manner. It seems like he's, He's relating to them in a fashion they can understand through their senses. God is real. More importantly, God is present and God is living. These are characteristics that the people can relate to as a human experience where he has not given them a form to see a face, a body, a head, anything that would generate in their minds that God is a being like this. Yet he talks to them in a way that says, 
these idols that these other people will have can't do these things. Yet he hasn't shown them that he does. Which I think is maybe a little bit of a foretelling to say, I'm coming in human form. I will, I will be with you. I can relate to you because I'm present. I'm living. I am your God. I think that's pretty cool. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. That was a long time ago. So I, I don't know how it really shook out. But what I'm reading leads me to that conclusion. He's, he's giving them some idea of what God is like. But he's relating it to what a human could understand and make relation with. And to me, again, do you, do you want to be a stone and wood idol that can't do all these things? Or are you going to be with a living God who someday is going to come in body form and do those exact things right alongside you? That's pretty cool. He reminds them that he is merciful and that he will not abandon or destroy them if they seek him. So they've got to continue seeking God again to me. We, we continue drawing this out. The treaty the treaty lives on, even after we've taken over the land. But you've got to seek him with all of your heart and soul. This is, this is not a check the box. Write a paragraph about it for a school assignment. This is deeply rooted in your being. It also, to me, again, making me think, is this really a foretelling of the way that we're all living right now? We're in sin. We're in distress. We've turned away from his law. We collectively, the humanity, uh, yet we're forgiven and still able to receive his grace and his mercy, which is exactly what he's just told them. I won't abandon or destroy you, but you've, you've got to Seek me, not on the surface, but deep, rooted. I am your God, and I, I am here with you. So verse 32, we're getting close to the chapter, and I know we're just about out of time. Verse 32, God has shown great and wonderful things, and they have, a, have not existed anywhere else or at any other time. He's telling the nations this. He's reminding them. I've shown you all of this stuff. This hasn't, there's no comparison. Nobody else, nowhere else does this exist. He goes even as far as saying, ask anybody anywhere. You'll hear this. Ask anybody, have they seen or experienced the greatness and the wonders that God has performed for you and given you? God is great. Has any other God spoken with a voice out of the fire? Nope. Has any other God taken one nation out of another? So, removing Israel out of Egypt. Uh, by all these different ways, by the testings that he was giving them, he tested them over and over. He gave them signs and wonders. They fought war or wars, many of them. He led them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So think about that visualization. A mighty hand that, that seems powerful, that seems we're conquering people. But in the same sentence, not even comma separated, they're together. Mighty hand and outstretched arm. Those go together. The outstretched arm, I'm your God, I'm with you. I'm powerful leading you, but my arms around you, I'm right here with you. Pretty great stuff. And he goes even further, great and awesome deeds. Uh, I, I don't think we would argue with any of that. The, the things we're seeing, the things we're hearing that they did and accomplished through him. Who else? Nobody. No body, no being, no God, no spirit. No, just him. Verse 39, God is in heaven above and on earth below. Interesting. Gets us back into the he's present. He's living. Powerful stuff, maybe things they hadn't heard before since they've only seen cloud and, and fire. But he's telling them again, I'm here. I'm with you. 
So keep his decrees and his commands so that you may live long in the land that he gave you for all time. Not just for a little while. This is yours. Unless a little time passes and you don't follow the rules. Then you've already been told what's going to happen. So he's just reminding him again. Stay the course. Things are going to be really great. Don't mess it up. It's going to be great. Then we start to hear at the very end of chapter four, he's starting to talk about the cities they're going to set aside for refuge. Now those are going to be detailed much better later, so I won't dwell on them now. We'll get to that in more detail later as they come up again, as they continue on in the process. But three cities east of the Jordan were set up as cities of refuge. We've studied those from time to time. Again, we'll cover them again later uh, in much more detail. So we're not going to gloss over them, but we will today. Um, so three cities on the east side of Jordan were set aside. Uh, and that's one for each of the tribes that were settling. There. So remember, it was two and a half tribes. Each of them basically has a city that will be declared a city of refuge. We'll go through what that means uh, in a couple of weeks or sooner, depending on when it comes up. And then the end of chapter four is a recap of the lands they've taken, which is King Sihon, King Og. So again, just rounding out the picture in the areas where we tend to make little breaks and declare a new chapter number, which didn't really happen then. But he's just recapping again. Here's what I've already done, and we're just getting started. Pretty cool thing. So that's going to close us out for today. I'm, I'm past time again. I shouldn't do that. So I appreciate your time. Uh, we're going to roll into service here pretty quick. Uh, and for those of you that, that weren't aware, uh, we have a number traveling. That includes Danny and Twyla. And that means, unfortunately, you're going to hear me talk again in here just a little bit. Uh, but it won't be about Deuteronomy necessarily. So it'll be about some other things. So thanks again. We'll see you next week or see you later.